Hours after the radio show is over, the audience gone, and the Eiffel Tower closed, we take you to a small janitor's closet near the top of the tower, beneath the door of which spills the light from a small lamp, and inside the janitor's closet, a cot, and on that cot lies Julian, janitor at the Eiffel Tower, sleeping. Well, he's not sleeping, actually. He's pretending to sleep. He's waiting for the great recitating platypus of the North to come. This is, of course, the old folk tale that if, when ill, one rests bravely, a platypus will come and recite poetry while you sleep, which will cause one to be healthy by the time one wakes up. It follows the nighttime around the world. It waits till it's dark in the place. In Paris, for centuries, children have believed, when ill, the platypus will come. The kids fall asleep, and they dream that the platypus has come. But it works. Yes, the platypus is the Parisian cure to the common cold. And they say when you wake up, if the platypus is still there, if you make a wish, whatever you wish for will come true. But if it's just a dream, how can he still be there when you wake up? Well, you know how, like, sometimes you wake up and, and whatever you're dreaming is just still, like, lingering there, you know, like a mirage? But if it's just a mirage, then how can the wish come true? I guess in the same way that the kids get better from being sick. In his own way, the janitor believes, too. All his life he's wanted to have that dream. Well, yeah. I mean, when you're a kid, they tell you it'll only come if you behave. I mean, what if your illness is that you always mess everything up? Suddenly, the janitor hears something outside his closet door. Something approaches. He holds his breath and digs into the covers. It is... Stagehands Jacques and Francois, who keep on walking by. It is now three in the morning. In the broadcast ballroom, late night construction continues on a giant set piece for tomorrow night's show. And, in the stagehand's lounge, Jacques and Francois can be found having this conversation. <laughs> hey, you hear that janitor talking to himself about the resuscitating platypus? Resuscitating. It's the great resuscitating platypus. My ass it is. What are you, a Russian spy? It's resuscitating. There ain't no such word. It's resuscitating. As in, to recite, idiot. Things supposed to recite magic poems. Oh, yeah. It resuscitates sick children. Resuscitating, that's what it does. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't exist. He does, too, exist. He makes people feel better. What the hell was that? It's the janitor spying on us through the heat and vent. Crazy kid. Meanwhile, in his janitor's closet, the janitor takes his head out of the heating duct and, unable to sleep, paces around the tiny room. Noticing the saws that usually hang on his closet walls are gone. The saws? He leaves the closet and begins to climb the outer girders of the nighttime tower. Yeah, the until he reaches his favorite spot near the tower's very tip. Here, he places his ear to the metal on one of the girders and begins to listen. He takes his ear from that girder and lays it against another. And another. You see, the missing saws can mean only one thing. Host John Cameron is appearing with them on another late night radio show. There it is. In Mr. Cameron's presence, ordinary hardware hand saws, the jagged metal things used to cut down trees, seem to come to life. They hop up on stools and begin warbling out a singing sound right into the microphone. Mr. Cameron's saws are responsible for seven of the ten singles at the top of the popular charts. Popular holiday classic, Do You Saw What I Saw, holding at number two, and the magician's anthem, I Saw Her, standing there, spending three weeks at number one. Saw manufacturers struggle to keep up with the demand from French teenagers. Saws have replaced dolls and footballs as toys for French children. And all this despite the fact that everybody knows that hardware saws can't hop up on stools and sing on international radio. 
The janitor, resting his head against the cool metal of the fog-wet girder, closes his eyes and listens. Inspired, the janitor longs himself for the warm glow of the stage and decides to engage in what has recently become a late-night occupation, stealing the microphone from the broadcast ballroom to practice speaking into it. He climbs down and sneaks in a side door of the ballroom. The microphone stands gleaming at the center of the stage in front of the closed curtain. Behind the curtain, work on the giant set piece continues and the janitor hears his name being mentioned. Chief stagehand Letitia Saltier can be heard strategizing about how to keep the janitor away from said fragile giant set piece, as stagehand Jacques playfully teases her, as the stagehands often do, about her obsession with the janitor. And I don't think he should be allowed to use the stagehand shower. No, no. In fact, he cannot be on set at all anymore. Jeez, Letitia, you're really obsessed with him. You know, I think maybe you're in love with him. Oh, Jacques. Jacques, what? I want you to put yourself in another room so that I do not have to fill out the injury report about your broken teeth. The janitor creeps on stage, trying desperately not to make a sound, and carefully unplugs the microphone, taking it and its stand with him as he stealthily exits the ballroom. He brings it into the closed tower cafeteria where he steals a jelly donut and places the microphone down in front of him. Looking at the microphone, even alone, his heart starts pounding. He nervously takes a bite of the donut and closing his eyes, he begins to speak. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Suddenly, a human form comes up from behind him. I don't know. Oh, oh God, who are you? Coco. Hi. It's Coco, the elderly night watchman of the Eiffel Tower. What are you doing with that microphone? I, you know, I told you every time I go in the air, like, I, I see the microphone and I freeze. Yes. I thought if I practiced talking into it, like, oh, maybe I could get good at it. And how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> Not very good. Uh, and I should be able to do it. I mean, God, you know, I told you I, like, always imagine that I have an audience. Yes. I mean, it's like we're in a movie or something something like like Greta Garbo and Melvin Douglas on the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> I'm not Greta. <laughs> I'll be Greta. Okay. I mean, try it, Coco. Like, imagine there's an audience with us. Like, right now. Okay. I mean, it kind of calms you down, doesn't it? Feeling like somebody's out there, you know, like on the other side. I pray sometimes. It is now 4 a.m. Feeling the precious hours in which the microphone's absence will not be noticed slipping away, the janitor bids Coco farewell and takes the microphone down the freight elevator and out of the tower. There is one place in the world where he can practice speaking into the microphone and not be interrupted. The janitor has a secret. At the base of the tower, he wanders past the old gypsy guitarist who plays there all night, most every night. Hola, chico. Hey. Que tal? Oh, no, nothing. Where'd you get that nice microphone from? It's beautiful. Oh, um, I borrowed it. Oh, cuídate con eso. It's muy precioso. Be careful. It's very precious. Yeah. Well, it's buenas noches, chico. Good night. The janitor walks on and, keeping to the shadows, passes through the nighttime streets. <laughs> he walks. And walks. On and on. Until he reaches the River Seine. There, hidden underneath a bridge, lies one of the janitor's secrets. A small aluminum rowboat that he'd found abandoned floating down the river some weeks ago. 
he sneaks down under the bridge, unties his small boat, and gets in. He sets the microphone up in front of him on its stand and begins rowing. So nervous does speaking into the microphone make him still that he decides to practice by telling a story, a story that always calms him down. Um, okay. What I was going to tell you about was um, that I had this friend um, who was the greatest rhythmic genius that the world has ever known. He, um, he was born um, tone deaf and um, he was born colorblind and he couldn't talk until he was like five. He didn't learn to talk, but he could hear these rhythms. Like say there's a refrigerator humming and somebody's breathing in one part of the room and somebody's breathing in another part of the room and there's crickets outside and say someone's walking down the stairs and a plane flies overhead and, and a cat is purring and all of those together, they make a giant rhythm that he could recognize. But when he was a kid, uh, like his parents, okay, so his parents were like always fighting. Uh, they were they were alcoholics, and and they, they they were just always screaming at each other, and 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 there was a lot of violence and stuff. And um, but he noticed, like when he was super little, that whenever things were bad, or like whenever something bad was about to happen, whenever something like dangerous or scary was about to happen there was always a certain kind of rhythm that was occurring, like a certain family of rhythms. Um, and, and, and every single time his parents fought, that kind of rhythm was present. And, and then he noticed also that whenever things were good, like, like really, really good, like those days when like, you know, like when time slows down and, and like when, when things get really vast and, 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 and everything's really wonderful and, and, and people are really happy, like, on those days, there was another kind of rhythm. And, and so he started doing these experiments when he was a kid. He started, like when his parents were fighting, right? He'd just start breathing and like drumming his fingers on the table and tapping his foot and trying to turn the bad kind of rhythm into a good one. And what he found was that whenever he did this, everybody in the room couldn't help but join in the good rhythm with them. They'd start breathing in the same pattern that he was breathing and they'd start rocking back and forth unconsciously like in their seats in the same rhythm that he was doing and they'd start tapping their own feet and suddenly what would happen is the bad rhythm would turn into a good rhythm and his parents would stop fighting. And invariably for him the whole thing would lead to ice cream. But you know, by the, like the time I met him, he was totally grown up, and he would travel constantly. He'd just pass through, and, and then that'd be it. You know, like you'd see him in another year or something. But all that he would do is he would go to these places where people were really sad, or or, or things were scary, like really dangerous places, and he would just change the rhythm. Like he'd go, he'd like walk into like a cafe or something, you know, like or an all-night diner, and he'd just start breathing and like and tapping his foot. And, and, and tapping on the table and moving like his fork or his spoon around and slowly everybody like the whole feeling in like the place would lift you go into like like an emergency room in like a hospital people would start smiling people would be like putting their arms around each other and and and, and laughing but what happened was was like as time went on, he just kept going to places that were more and more dangerous and more and more scary. It was right before the last war that we were in. He had a plan to go to the city that we were going to bomb because he wanted to be there when the bombs were dropping so that he could change the rhythm of the sound of the bombs dropping for the people that the bombs were dropping on. And I, I didn't want him to go. But this is what he told me. He said that it was incredibly important that the story of his life have a very specific rhythm. And that in order for that to happen, it was incredibly important that he die on beat. 
I don't know how to explain it. But it worked. Because every time I ever tell this story, the rhythmic thing in the story happens. And, and every time anybody tells anybody this story, it happens too. And the janitor leans back, wipes the sweat off his brow, and having spoken successfully into the microphone, continues to roll farther and farther down the set. Meanwhile, back in the broadcast ballroom, off in its corner behind the stage, the orchestral wakes up, preens itself, and begins to practice for tomorrow night's show. I think maybe you are in love with him. What? Oh, oh come on, I've seen the way you look at him, Jacques. Wow. From across a crowded room, okay, you look at him. Wow. Now little, like, like your heart beat out of your chest, you know. You know who I really I, feel that way about? Uh, I don't want to know. No. That box first? No, you can't. You have to hang that thing just to make sure when you climb the ladder, someone is holding it for you. Oh, so you care? Yeah. Oh, she cares, everybody! Oh boy, I care. <laughs> you can fall off all the ladder you want in the privacy of your own home, but here you have someone spot you, you know? This is not John Cameron. He's still asleep back home in bed. This is the imaginary narrator inside the janitor's head. The orbiting human circus wishes you a good night. What's the matter, little Jimmy? My dog ran away. Hmm. How long's it been? Four days. Did you walk him often? Pretty often. Leave him chained up in the backyard? Uh-huh. And we're near the coast here, aren't we? You know, little Jimmy, he may be in the city of drowned sailors. The city of drowned sailors? That's right, little Jimmy on the ocean floor. Cities of drowned sailors are just full of pets who have been cast away and mistreated by us in the world up above. They're kept in big fish tanks full of air for all of the children who have drowned in ocean liners and passenger ships to look at. So few of their own pets drown with them that children in cities of drowned sailors grow lonely. To see real living pets makes the children so happy that late at night, the kindly drowned sailors come up in old-fashioned diving suits filled with water. Filled with water? Drowned sailors need water, like you and I need air. They wander through our neighborhoods looking for animals who have been mistreated or neglected, animals who don't look as though they are being loved, and these are the ones they bring back with them. But I love Bayo. Is that so? Well. They have been known to make mistakes. If you think that your pet has accidentally been taken to a city of drowned sailors, there is only one thing to do. Do you have a photograph of yourself and Fido Jimmy? One that shows how much you love him? Yes, sir. Place it in a mason jar and close up the lid good and tight. And you take that mason jar down to the waterfront and toss it right into the sea. It'll go right to them. When they see how much you love Fido, They'll feel terrible and return him to you, sometimes the very same night. Thank you, sir. I will. <laughs> well, is this Fido? Down, boy. Yes, sir. Well, he sure looks happy now. Yes, sir, and I ain't never gonna let him get taken to the city of drowned sailors ever again. And remember, boys and girls, walk your dog at least three times a day. Brush your pet often. Keep them well fed. Keep them happy. And most of all, make sure you always 
of a photograph on hand that shows just how much you love them. This is Christy Gressman from the Orbiting Human Circus. Thank you all so much for being a part of our world and for joining us right here. If you'd like to help us out and support the show, take our audience survey at orbitinghumancircus.com survey. And as a tiny thank you, if you email a screenshot of the last page of your completed survey to podcast at orbitinghumancircus.com, we will pick three out of a hat and send them Orbiting Human Circus pillowcases, signed by the janitor himself. So take the survey at orbitinghumancircus.com survey and send us a screenshot to podcast at orbitinghumancircus.com. And from all of us here at the Orbiting Human Circus, thank you and sweet dreams.